let's start with our opening question for the day. Um, what is something that has surprised you so far this summer from the internship or from gardening? Um, let's start with Elise. I feel like just working a lot outside, just like building up my endurance. I, a lot of people think I couldn't do it and I can, and it's not that hard. And I actually like it a lot. People are like, I don't want to work outside all day. I'm like, yes, please. I hope I get to keep doing that. Wonderful. Discovering things about yourself you didn't know. Uh, Haley? How much weeding there is to do. <laughs> There's a lot of weeding. Yeah. Which is perfect for today's topic. <laughs> yes. Uh, Natalie? Kind of similar to Haley's, we've been having a lot of weeds too, but another interesting thing is we have a lot of purslane in a lot of our gardens and it just keeps growing. And a lot of like the new Americans will actually like eat it because it's like healthy for you. So they've been giving us recipes to try. So that's been really interesting. Wonderful. <clears throat> and I shared a link to a webinar that I did back in 2015 on edible weeds, and there's a purslane recipe in there too. Joshua. Probably the most interesting thing that I would consider different for me or interesting in general would be just how much there is to prepare for planting. I've got really gotten a lot of experience now with having to figure out how to plant my high tunnel. So it was just interesting just how much you have to do to actually get it prepped. Definitely. And Clara. Um, I guess something that's been interesting to experience has been to learn to just go with the flow a little bit. Like things don't always go as expected or things come up like you don't expect to have to place a high tunnel cover in June or all of these things and just kind of like rolling with the punches a little bit and just like having this attitude of do what you can and that's the best that you can do and not stress out about it. I think that's a key lesson that a lot of farmers <laughs> learn and you're learning it early, which is great. And Devin. Well, this week, um, this week especially, I've been learning more about the marketing aspect and the idea, like I, I'm a bit of a programmer, as I mentioned before, so I've been helping out Noreen with a lot of that stuff. And uh, I've been, most of the stuff I'm doing is supposed to build like um, a kind of piece of trust with the consumer. So like, um, like I set up a page that uh, has links and has a way to look at all, a lot of different news pages and news articles that she's been in. And um, that that's adds like credibility to your business. It adds, uh, yeah, and then also, uh, another thing is like uh, I added a uh, review system to your website, which also adds that same kind of credibility, that same kind of, um, yeah. So yeah, I've learned a lot about that part of the business. And then I also, I mean, those uh, weeds do spring up on you that I, I uh, when she mentioned that earlier, that was, yeah, they, they, they certainly do. Great. Well, um, the portal is not loading for me. So we will, um, I guess I'll have to follow up with you all uh, after class. Who who was not able to submit their experience report this week? I wasn't. Haley, okay. I'm gonna try again because I've almost finished my uh, report. Okay. And Haley, what happened when you tried to submit your experience report? It was red. It wouldn't let me click on it at all. And then it I could do this week, but I couldn't do last week. Okay. So last week's the one that that wasn't working. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I will follow up with you later this evening after I'm, I don't know why it won't load. Um, my Zoom slows things down, so it might just be that. Uh, um, there's also a bug going on in your um, time card where if you accidentally go on the wrong day, then it won't let you reset that unless you still have a description there. So yeah, I, it, it's kind of strange, but yeah, that's it won't work if there's not a description there, uh, even if you have zero hours. Okay. I am putting the email 
for our farms as IT person directly in the chat box. Devin, could you email that bug directly to him? And I will I will mention it, but um, then you can describe exactly what you just described to me directly to him. I was able to get mine submitted successfully. I don't know what happened last night. Okay, so Joshua, you got yours submitted. Yep. All right, well, we will get those bugs sorted out. <clears throat> And uh, we are talking about bugs of a different sort today. Um, your pre-work was to read the sections in the Market Gardener about weed management and about um, insects and pest diseases. And so uh, it's the time of year when farmers start spending a lot of time weeding. So I wanted to discuss that. First of all, I'm curious, uh, who all has already started spending your days on the farm weeding? Me. That's what I've been doing the last few weeks. <laughs> and Natalie and Clara and Elise and Haley. Have you done any weeding yet, Josh? I've done a bit of everything. So in the market gardener, Mr. Fortier, um, talked about several different methods of controlling weeds. And so I put together a few slides just going through what he was discussing. So he talked about uh, hoe, uh, cultivating with hoes, um, weeding with tarps, something called a stale seed bed technique, soil solarization, flame weeding, and mulching. So we'll go through in the order that he mentioned them, but we can, uh, we'll spend a little more time on some of these than others, such as um, mulching, which um, I know that Josh has been doing at his site. So he started out talking about cultivating with hose. Um, so are you guys doing that on your farms? I love using the stirrupole. It works so nicely with the raised beds. I love it. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Yep, we're using the stirrupole as well. And the regular, and then also at our personal farm. Mm -hmm. Although on Stephanie, she's only really used the regular hole that I've seen. Mm -hmm. And also on our personal farm, we, um, there's like a stirrupole-like attachment for the wheel hoe. That's really cool. Okay. So it sounds like you guys like the stirrup hoe and he recommended it as well. Um, the, the third one over is, what was it? It's a, a collinear hoe developed by Elliot Col Coleman. I had never seen one of those, so I went and Googled it. Um, a lot of the resources that he mentions in this part of the book, uh, when I Googled them, most, almost, all of them came up from Johnny Seeds. So whoever runs Johnny Seeds is clearly a fan of the market gardener and makes a point to stock a lot of the tools that he suggests in the book. So we were talking about these different styles of hose. And um, in the past, some of the new Americans at Growing Together have favored uh, a kind of an African hoe. Um, some of the leadership team was telling me about it once. A few of them had it and it worked really well. So then they went looking and were able to mail order more of this particular style. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to um, his next method of weed control. And he called this weeding with tarps and Johnny's uh, actually had a video about it. Hi, I'm Adam Lemieux and I'm here to talk to you about silage tarps. Why does Johnny sell silage tarps? Silage tarps are five mil polypropylene plastic. We use them to create stale seed beds and so do our customers. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you today about some of their uses and how to handle them because they're big and they're heavy and they're cumbersome. So how do silage tarps help you make a stale seed bed? A stale seed bed creates a weed-free environment for your crop to germinate in. The process is called occultation. Okay, and it's a process by which you're covering a prepared bed, already set up, it might be a raised bed, it might not, however you want to do it, 
and you're covering it with that silage tarp and this creates a nice warm moist environment a perfect environment for those weed seeds that are already there in the soil to germinate and once they germinate there's no light and they subsequently die as they're dying and decaying uh, the earthworms come up and they feed on that and it creates this very rich fertile environment uh, and weed free environment for your, your crops to grow. Have any of you tried or seen that method of weed control? I've seen it, um, but it's not with tarp. I don't know if it's different or if it's the same thing, but it's with cardboard. Like you layer the cardboard down and it does similar, kills it and then the earthworms come up. I don't know. That's mm -hmm. the same. I always thought it was just smothering the weeds, but he makes some really great points about how the tarps heat up the soil so the weeds germinate faster, but then they can't grow because there's no light under there. We actually have that at DCB now that I think about it. We have it in one of our high tunnels. It also helps to heat the roots, some plants like warmer roots. So mm -hmm. typically we like to plant um, plants that like warmer roots in there. He also mentioned mulch and we will get to that in a second, but I think you guys are putting down dark um, row cover to heat up uh, the soil around the plants that love heat. Like with the earlier question, uh, our farm uses cardboard and also uses um, uses mats. But uh, Noreen, I haven't seen that as much. I've seen her actually mulch with the weeds that she pulls up sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that that's all I've seen at her farm so far. Does anyone one want to take a shot at defining what he means by stale seed bed technique? I think it's it's like when you cover it and you let the weeds grow just so you could hoe them out. And just like get rid of all the weeds so that you're able to plant your seeds and they get like a start, a weed free start. Exactly. Yeah. And this was something I hadn't heard of before, but he intentionally prepares the seed bed. What did he say? 15 days in advance, which is just long enough for the, the weeds to get started and then he gets rid of them. The one thing I remember reading about it that could be really risky is you have to be very careful not to let more seed, uh, weeds germinate than a certain uh, le level of them. You only want to let like the first six inches of weeds germinate, otherwise you're in a lot of trouble. I know they talked about like a harrow or something, and I don't know what that is. It's, it's sort of like a giant comb. It, it just cultivates the very top layer by sort of raking, like it's like fingers raking through the soil. Yeah, okay, I think I've seen one actually then. And exactly, Josh, if you, he says, if you dig too deeply, you'll bring up deeper buried seeds that'll then germinate and cause more problems. Um, he also mentioned soil solarization. It was in a sidebar. Anybody wanna define that? I heard this as a way to start like new garden beds and grass like a year before cover the grass in like black tarp and then just have the sun just kill everything under it so then you don't have a bunch of grass growing in your bed the next year but then it did say in the book that it kills like everything like all the microbes in the soil as well so I don't know yeah. it, it's a trade-off I guess it sounds like he, it's for extreme circumstances like grass is really hard to kill so it might be worth it in that case would that be one that you would use for like the rhizome weeds, the ones that have the rhizomes that never go away? You mean like how grass will spread underneath the ground? Yeah, or like like bindweed too, those kind of things that have the rhizomes that literally like you can't just, that's not a seed. Um, would that be one that you would use for that? I don't know the answer to that. Um, that would be a great question for your host farmers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I keep curious if, if somebody has been successful at that, because those are really difficult weeds, um, the bindweed and anything that spreads under the ground. What about flame weeding? This is like the most exciting <laughs> of all the methods. My farm has one, but I don't think they use it very often. Have any? Oh, it's not fancy. It was handmade and looks very scary. <laughs> surprised when I heard it. I thought that you were actually uh, like basically uh, torching the weeds, not just 
damaging them cellular cellularly. Mm -hmm. I am kind of fascinated by his, he says he, they sort of use it in conjunction with the stale seed bed. Like they, what does he say? You start the seed bed and then halfway through this, the 15 days, then you plant your plants, but then you flame it to kill the weeds before the plants emerge. Michael, if I if he was here, I would ask if the flaming doesn't have the potential to burn the sprouts or the seeds under the soil. Go ahead. Question for you. Mm -hmm. Are all of these methods more supposed to be used before you plant? I doubt you would want to do flame weeding when you already have crops, young crops growing, because that would be very dangerous to them. Same with like your stale weeding or your stale uh, seed your stale seed method. I think most of these are um, before you plant, with the exception of mulching and hoeing, which mostly is between rows. Um, and of course, there's just hand pulling. Uh, I also wanted to point out that there is a great Smithsonian article linked here um, about how Flame weeding is used not just by gardeners, but is also uh, useful to conservationists who are trying to eliminate invasive weeds on um, protected lands and parks and things. <clears throat> um, so check out that article. Mulching. Who is using mulch? Whose farms use mulch? Awesome. Um, what kind of mulching do you see on uh, family roots farm, Elise. We have straw, we have hay, we have alfalfa. Jenna also has like some mesh type stuff where she cut like holes where the plants are. Mm -hmm. I lay down a lot of alfalfa. What about uh, hardened soil? Yeah, we just put alfalfa on the tomatoes last week, but I'm like extremely allergic to alfalfa, so it's really not. <laughs> oh, my nose was covered. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've used straw and then um, Often when we put down drip line, we have some like heavy duty, like plastic, like woven material that will like, will bury the edges of it and then cut holes for the plants to come out. And that works really well. Mm -hmm. And then there's this like really thin plastic on the tomatoes in the high tunnel. It's red and apparently that helps them ripen better, faster. I don't know. I don't know if I believe that at all, <laughs> but that one's kind of a pain. It doesn't like, any gust of wind and it's. I am uh, fascinated by the different materials that are used um, for mulch. And he, uh, in the book, he mentions landscape fabric and biodegradable film, which reminded me of this article in Civil Eats about how there's an increasing amount of microplastic found in soil. And one of the, um, one of the concerns is it coming from degraded plastic mulch. Now, I'm thinking this is probably coming from much larger scale farms than you all are interning on, but um, I, I like that he mentioned that there's this biodegradable plastic film available that he uses. We haven't done it yet, but um, Friend Soil was part of this grant project with NDSU where some students have developed this. I, don't, I haven't seen it yet, so I, I can't speak to it too much, but um, it, it's, you spray this like liquid paper and then it like, it like dries. And so it's like this like paper material that's used as mulch and then it biodegrades. So there's no plastic involved. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, like your paper macheing over the top of your soil. Basically, that's what I'm envisioning. I might be wrong, but that's how it was explained to me. I would love to find out how that works. Um, around my flowers and garden plants, um, because I don't, because I don't have a bagger on my lawnmower, so I don't have grass clippings handy. I sometimes save brown uh, packing paper and just like lay that down as mulch. And it's sort of the rain, it, it gets rained on and then it just sort of gets soggy and 
<laughs> accretes to the soil, sort of like that. But that is fascinating. Do you ever use anything like newspaper? Do you think that would work at all? Like if you were shredded newspaper? Uh, I would have questions about the kind of ink that. Yeah, that's true. With. If it's a if it's a soy based or you know plant based ink, that would be fine. In our farm, um, with the uh, with the mulch projects that we've done on my personal farm, not uh, not Noreen's, but we've had to do um, stronger mulches, but like uh, like the gravels and the um, gravel sand and um, landscape fabric. Um, our landscape fabric is biodegradable, but. Yeah, it, it, we've had to put down stronger mulches than like paper mache. That feels like that never worked with it. We use it just because um, it's used for perennials and uh, they're, they're, the weeds around their our farm tend to get pretty big if there's anything thin. Do the sand and gravel work well? Do they keep weeds from coming up between? Sand and gravel work pretty well for the first year and maybe going through to the second. But in the second year, you're getting more small weeds, not big, bigger weeds, but uh, you're still getting weeds. And then eventually, uh, eventually, I think it's just, all, it might be our farm too, because uh, we don't, our farm is on a hill and it all washes down to the creek eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then also it's it, our farm. Yeah, it, so it, 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 it just, it doesn't last as long as um, layers of cardboard boxes or um, the landscape fabric. Um, Haley, what is, uh, what kind of mulching is happening either at your home farm or at Rognerud's? <laughs> um, at Ragnarud's, we use the plastic mulch over some of them. Um, the onions this year, they did some straw, and that I think was mostly not just for the weeds, but to for the cold when it got really cold. Um, and then my personal little farm, um, I do wood mulch. Um, I've been really interested. I've been reading on it's called Back to Eden Gardening, um, and you use wood mulch so it, and that's been it's been doing really well every year I kind of add a little bit more so I've got about four inches right now do you do you have to be careful about the types of wood um I get it from my dad he's got a wood mulcher so he takes it right off of their farm okay I I think I've read that certain trees um can acidify the soil and cause problems but I don't know if those are trees we have around here. Yeah, I'm not sure. So far, I haven't had much, I haven't had any problems. Great. What kind of, how, how thick is your wood mulch? I know I, I was doing a composting project with wood mulch and never quite got it finished, but was working on one for a little while and am planning on finishing it uh, this year or next year. But uh, I know for composting, it's, at least uh, wood mulch has to be pretty thin. So I'm just kind of interesting. Yeah, so my one garden, I have about four inches right now. My back garden that I just, it's brand new this year. I don't have anything on it right now. And that's the one that I'm dealing with the bindweed, the devil. <laughs> um, and I don't dare cover that up right now because it will just, it'll find its way out. So I'm trying to just, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to get rid of that right now. I, I, I you, you mentioned that earlier, but I meant the actual, with the actual pieces. Oh, I don't know. They're, I mean, they're, it's not like fine shredded. Is it li like just through a normal wood chipper? Yep. Um, Josh, uh, I, I remember April saying that you guys were mulching with grass clippings. Um, have you gotten to start that? Uh, I actually almost finished doing the mulching for the high tunnel. So we use the uh, grass clippings just from the lawnmower here on campus. And we put that into a, a compost pile, so it's slowly been composting. But there's been a slight problem that we've really been noticing with it. This is a school campus with uh, sports kids who don't care about uh, leaving trash behind. So I'm constantly having to pick out candy wrappers and sometimes zip ties, and just a bunch of other random little trash pieces that can be kind of frustrating enough to keep pulling out. But for the most part, it's got grass clippings. It had a bit of straw in it, leaves, a lot of leaves. Um, occasionally, uh, some white actual dirt, with, dirt with roots and grass. If that makes sense. So sometimes it, uh, the lawnmower ends up just chipping into the side of the ground, and 
we end up getting some of those occasionally. They're annoying to deal with because it's hard to break them up. Because with mulch, you really do need to break it up a bit. You don't want to have it be too solid right away. Great. And I know another one of our high tunnels we're using straw. The tomato high tunnel we have here on campus is, I, I believe it's straw. It's something similar to it, at least. Did anyone read the article I shared? I think it was last week from Prairie Road Organic. It was a blog post about how to keep your baby plants happy in the heat. So you want to go, Clara? You nodded your head. Yeah, I just kind of skimmed through it, but um, they're saying that mulching can also just like maintain soil temperature a little bit much. Uh, uh, um, and then it is quite a bit of mulch, like kind of like up above like the small seedlings, it can help them uh, prevent sunburn and then retain soil moisture as well. Yeah. And I don't know if she made it clear, but they use like a deep mulch system mm -hmm. where and no-till. So they've been establishing that, you know, they've probably got a foot or two of mulch going and it's been that way for like over 10 years. So it just, the mulch degrades underneath and makes a layer of hummus rich soil. Um, and <clears throat> I think that's sometimes called lasagna gardening which we'll probably talk more about that when we get to soil health. Um, so before we move on to the section on insects and diseases, there was one more point that he made at the beginning of the section about weeds. And that was simply that um, at his farm, they plant their crops really tightly together so that they shade out the weeds too. So they're both maximizing space and shading out weeds. Yes, Devin. Squash especially tend to kill all of the weeds at our farm in, with certain crops. Uh, and yeah, that, but those pumpkins are great that way. Because so of the wide all, leaves? Not early weeds, but later weeds they uh, take care of. Great. And um, it's... Too bad Marcella isn't with us today because she said she's working on a Three Sisters uh, project, which is where you grow beans, corn, and squash together. And I think the role of the squash in that triple pairing is to shade out the weeds for the other two plants. Any last comments about weeds before we move on to the next topic? Okay. Great conversation today, by the way. Um, it's not every day that you have a conversation entirely about weeds. So he also talks about insects and diseases. And I wanted to point out his very first point, which is, I think, key uh, about how biodiversity is the first line of defense. Are any of your farmers implementing practices to increase biodiversity of, of wildlife and insect, beneficial insects, things that you've seen, bat houses. Yeah, Devin? I've seen this a lot in Noreen's farm and our farm. Um, our farm specifically, certain flowers, and her farm too, um, certain flowers we plant around her crops, not only to make it look nice, but also to, uh, like marigolds, get rid of um, cutworms really quickly, and other flowers like geraniums might help with the smell of brassicas that attracts um, caterpillars, uh, so loopers. And then um, also, I don't know if this is quite biodiversity, but um, red cabbage, the loopers do not never bother quite as much as um, green cabbage. So there's certain little tricks like that that uh, our farm implements to make sure that uh, we don't get completely harassed by our pets. You know, that's a good point and something that he didn't really touch on about pest management is simply prevention by planting species that are naturally resistant. Um, on our farm, uh, I haven't really noticed them do much with trying to bring in diversity, but they live right next to the river. So they get a lot of that naturally um, with bringing the dragonflies and amphibians and stuff in. But as far as like my own stuff, that's something that I've really been trying to work on in my own yard this year is bringing in more of that permaculture and kind of 
working with uh, in my vegetable gardens I have flowers intermixed in there and so I'm excited to kind of see what how how that produces this year versus last definitely I know on ACB farms we tend to do a lot of different species or cultivars of plants rather than as many beneficial insects because in a high tunnel we can't get as many beneficial insects to stay in there so we instead prefer to use different uh, cultivars of say tomatoes or peppers because they may go for one cultivar but they may not like another cultivar so mm -hmm. at least we'll get some do they still release the praying mantises in the high tunnels josh not that i know of i don't believe they do anymore i know they i don't know if they actually did last year either i know we've started to rely more on uh, ladybugs to handle our aphid problems but other than that, there's only so much we can afford to do as well, because that's another thing is to, if you're going to use beneficial insects, you have to be able to afford to buy them to at least get, get started. And you can never buy one breeding pair. You always have to buy a thousand breeding pairs. Mm -hmm. How are you sure not to, not to like introduce too many of your good bugs? Like, how do you know? Do you think farmers just too many bugs and they just mess up their little ecosystem? It tends to be a system of checks and balances. Um, mm -hmm. If you have, you will usually add too many uh, insects because they will take out a lot of the uh, pest, but then mm -hmm. your new beneficial insects will die off to um, match the new amount of um, pests. And then the pest population will rise because there aren't as many predators. And so it just keeps going in a continuous circle. That makes sense. Well, uh, what about scouting? He talks about uh, walking the fields every day to check for new pests. Um, have any of you helped with that? Clara, you're nodding your head. Flea beetles on our brassicas. And then there's just so many baby grasshoppers. So we're just bracing for that time. But potato bugs or whatever whatever the bugs are on the potatoes are the ones that we scout for because that's something that we can kind of get ahead on a little bit more than the others. Do you hand pick them or do you have another method? Um, we haven't found any yet. I think the initial is to like if we do find some hand pick and then if it gets too much using an organic approved spray unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Another trick that we use is diatomaceous earth, which is um, it's it's an earth created with uh, diatoms, a natural algae, and uh, that tends to kill uh, some insects better than others. But yeah, yep, those are the tools that our farm uses. And I think it it's like tiny hard particles that abrade and cut the insects, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's like a yeah, it, it's it's kind of interesting. They're just the way that they break is into sharp little shards. Yeah, diatoms are like little creatures that are like exoskeletons. And so diatomized earth, it's like the exoskeletons that cut everything up. Definitely. And it has lots of uses too. I I think it's used in uh, grain storage to prevent grain beetles too. And I can add for scouting. I know because I took a class or two for um, UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles. So basically drones. Mm -hmm. They've started to use drones to do scouting to tell you exactly where insect or where pests are from the air. If it's visible, it'll find them and it'll note which ones are there. So well, that would take 20 farmers to do in a whole day. A drone would be able to do in like an hour. Just something to find interesting. So insects are quite small. Does the drone just have a really great camera or do they you have to like come down close? It has a good camera. Wow. Drones are definitely becoming part of agriculture now, especially smaller farms. Pests that I haven't heard mentioned yet is birds. And they aren't usually pests for most crops, but uh, for specific berries and for, um, uh, yeah, for some, some crops that can be quite problemsome. So then to prevent that, we use uh, netting and we use, uh, yeah, so we, we've got ways to avoid those two. I don't, not, I don't know that any of them have anything to do with biodiversity, but I thought it was interesting, and I thought that, that it was something that I hadn't heard mentioned yet. Definitely. I mean, if you're going to bring up birds, you might as well also bring up a couple of the other larger pests, 
rabbits, deers, mm -hmm. they will also cause problems. Yeah, at our, or her farm, she has guinea fowl to help like scare away the foxes and stuff, make sure they don't eat the chickens. Yeah, we have a lot of electric fencing for deer. Is that effective? So far it's worked. So the, the fear is that it'll be effective against the dog too though. Oh, Natalie, uh, what kind of pests have, have been in uh, growing together gardens so far? Yeah, I'm a little nervous to talk. Hopefully my Wi-Fi works, but we've had some potato beetles too and some bean beetles as well. A lot of our beans um, just like looked like lace. There were holes all over the beans. So we started spraying neem oil and that seems to be working pretty well. Like a lot of the new growth doesn't have as many like bite holes in it. The only problem is like you do it after you water and then if it rains, which we haven't gotten a lot of rain, but I mean, it rained yesterday, then the neem oil kind of comes off. So then you have to spray again. Um, other than that, for the beans as well, we've planted some oregano because supposedly that's supposed to kind of deter the bean beetles. Yeah, that's kind of all we've been dealing with. We've been looking for um, potato beetle eggs also on like our egg plants and we found some. So then we just put them in some water. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of it, though. Uh, either last year or the year before, Growing Together had some Facebook posts about squash borers, and it sounded like you had, like, they had to just, like, go in by hand and, like, dig them out from the squash vines, which sounded like a oh lot gosh, of we haven't had Yeah, we haven't had any of that this year, thank goodness. Hopefully, crossing my fingers, we don't deal with that this year. Yeah. Corn borers, both we have had problems with before, and the only way we figured out how to deal with them is with a natural spray. We haven't, uh, we haven't found a really natural way to deal with those yet. Did do you spray it on the corn plants? Yes, the corn plants and then squash plants. We haven't had that huge of a problem, but um, yeah, we've just thrown away the squash that have been bored for the uh, squash. The other day when I was out weeding our zucchini and our crookneck, um, they have the black mulch over the black plastic mulch and so many cucumber beetles were coming up underneath it and they said that they've never had really problems with those before so we're wondering if it was the plastic mulch that had something to do with it maybe makes it nice and warm for them or something yeah I'm not sure but that's the only pest I've really seen so far this year I guess in past years too like really heavy duty like landscape fabric um, has created habitat for voles ah uh. I have heard that. So one problem creates another. One solution creates another. Devin, yeah. We uh, also have a problem with some kind of beetle, not that often, but specifically for muskmelons and uh, honeydew. It will go after those and it'll, it seems to pick like one melon and uh, it'll, it, it, it creates like a colony. It's, it's really annoying, but uh, we haven't had any problems with those, of course, because we are melons aren't ripe yet, but if you let melons get overripe, they come in. For sure. Um, Josh, I have a request. Sorry, my mom just landed. Oh, um, I have a request for you. Um, would you ask April or Keith if they can tell us where there would be videos from the Integrated Pest Management Project that DCB did? Um, integrated Pest Management is a system of of scouting and using prevention and um, different, a combination of different techniques and finding the right system that works to address weeds and pests. And I know that they did a project on that. And if there's uh, videos, I'd love to share them with you all. I'm just not sure where to find them. Thank you guys. That was a really great discussion. Um, there's, there's not a lot of groups of people that you could have a, a really great discussion about uh, potato beetles and creepy crawlies with, but you guys are pretty awesome that way. So I don't really have a final reflection question because we had so much discussion during the session today. So just this is your chance for final comments, reflections, or questions. Look at my tan line from picking weeds. So bad, my gloves. I can see it. 
<laughs> um, on the intern portal, it has an event for tomorrow. That's optional, right? Oh, yeah. That is the um, Minokin Farm uh, Garden Day. That's totally optional. I just wanted you all to know. I just want you all to know about local foods and sustainable ag things happening throughout the state, but you're not required to attend those other ones. Okay, perfect. Really, my only final comment is uh, there, that attachment for the wheel hole makes wheel holes about a thousand more times more useful, a thousand times more useful. Uh, yeah, if, if you ever got a wheel hole or if your farm got a wheel hole and it hated them or it didn't really think that they were useful, uh, look up different attachments and there's like a blade one that just goes underneath the ground. It also doesn't break the top soil like a tiller would. So it, that, that's, that's my suggestion if you didn't like a wheel hoe. Awesome. Is that the stirrup attachment? Yeah, I think so. Definitely something to keep in mind. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, look for an email from me about the field day. Um, I don't have pre-work for next week because it is a field day. There is homework in your portal related to pests and weeds, and hopefully there'll be some more added about integrated pest management um, if I get that stuff from Dakota College of Botano. So have a great week, and I will see you in person next Monday.